Hello everyone, today we're going to continue our discussion of the x-ray tube and external components. In the last lecture we talked about the cathode, now we're going to move our attention to the other side of the tube, the anode. So you want to keep in mind that the cathode is negative and the anode is the positive side of the x-ray tube. There are two types of anodes. There are rotating anodes and there are stationary anodes. Stationary anodes have very limited uh, use. Today they're primarily used in dental uh, x-ray tubes. Rotating uh, are used in almost all areas of uh, radiography. Um, why rotating? Better heat distribution or dissipation. You want to keep in mind also that the anode acts as an electrical conductor. It receives the electrons from the filament and then allows them to flow through it and then back into the circuit. Remember, a circuit has to be a closed path. So you have the filament, then you've got a gap, and then you've got the anode. Remember, when you push that exposure button, the electrons are boiled off of the filament. They travel across the gap. They strike the anode. There, uh, heat's going to be made. X-rays are going to be made. But then what happens to the electrons after they do that? Then they travel on their way back into the circuit. The anode also provides mechanical support for the target. The target, of course, is on the face of the anode where the X-rays are going to be created. And the anode has to be a good thermal conductor because remember, uh, when you create x-rays, 99.8% uh, of the kinetic energy of the electrons turns into heat. As far as the anode disk itself, copper, molybdenum, and graphite are the most common anode materials. Let's focus our attention then to the target area. If we look at the cross section of the anode disc there, we can see the uh, graphite, we can see the molybdenum, uh, and then notice on the front of the anode disc is the target material where the X-rays are actually gonna be created, and that is tungsten. To the uh, tungsten, rhenium is added. And the rhenium allows for added mechanical strength, and it aids in combating the stress of repetitive effects of that thermal expansion and contraction uh, of the disc itself. Remember, when metal is heated, it expands. When it's cooled, it contracts. Tungsten is used as the target material for three primary reasons. There is a high atomic number, which allows for the efficient uh, x-ray production to occur, uh, provides good uh, heat dissipation, and it does have a very high melting point, 3400 degrees Celsius. Rotating anodes allow the electron beam from the cathode to the anode to interact with a larger area compared to a stationary anode, uh, allowing them for better heat dissipation uh, and less pitting. You can see down at the bottom some examples of anodes, the face of which have been pitted. Rotating anodes also allow for higher tube currents and shorter exposure times. Most revolve at 3400 RPM, although high capacity tubes rotate at about 10,000 RPM. Uh, faster rotation, greater heat dissipation. And then the stem connecting the anode to the rotor is made of molybdenum. That's important because molybdenum is a poor heat conductor. You don't want that heat to go from the anode disc into the rotor area. As far as the turning of the disc itself, this occurs through uh, what is called an induction motor. Induction motors operate on the principle of electromagnetism. Over to the right, you can see a diagram and cross section uh, of the induction motor that's going to spin the anode. 
And there are two principal parts that are separated from each other by either glass or metal uh, tube envelopes. You've got the outside of the envelope having the stator and the inside of the envelope is the rotor. So remember these two parts, the stator and rotor, do not physically touch one another. The stator is a series of electromagnets that are equally spaced around the neck of the tube. The rotor is a shaft made of bars of copper and soft iron. And how it turns then, sequential energizing, which means one turns on, uh, then it turns off, the next one turns on, then it turns off, the next one turns on, then it turns off, and so forth. Imagine them going around the uh, the tube itself, the sequential energizing of the stator windings creates a magnetic field that interacts with the iron containing rotor, causing it then to rotate. So if you think about this, you can, uh, the, the electricity can energize these electromagnets very quickly going around and then very, very quickly pull the rotor spinning the anode. And we want to keep in mind uh, that two-step exposure switches should be depressed in one motion. So remember there is that habit of text going on the rotor first, holding that down, giving breathing instructions, and then all the way down for the exposure. Uh, it's very common practice in clinical. However, um, <clears throat> any textbook that you look in, it's going, going to tell you not to do that. You're going to take it, you're going to push all the way down. Uh, you won't send the electrons over to hit the anode until that rotor gets to the correct speed, which is very quick. So that's why they suggest one depression. And then how does the rotor then slow down? Post-exposure, uh, the, uh, the anode actually slows its spin because the motor, the induction motor, is put into reverse, which then allows that uh, anode disc to stop spinning. The book talks about the line focus principle. We've talked about this before. If you look at the drawing, remember the whole principle uh, is based on the fact that you can have a large actual focal spot. And then because of the angle of the anode's face, you can have a smaller effective focal spot. Advantage, the larger actual focal spot allows for greater heat dissipation. The smaller effective focal spot is going to give you better detail. So if we read then, before rotating anodes were invented, the line focus principle was used to allow for a large area of electron bombardment, which of course would allow for greater heat dissipation while maintaining a small focal spot, as I said, giving you better detail. By angling the target, the effective focal spot becomes smaller while allowing the actual focal spot to remain a larger size. Diagnostic tubes have target angles uh, varying from about uh, 5 to approximately uh, 20 degrees, with the most common being about 12 degrees. Now, there's going to be variance uh, depending on what author uh, that you look at. Disadvantage, geometry of small angles limits the size of the radiation field coverage at very short SIDs. So that is a uh, concern. That's why you can't angle too much. Most tubes, as it says, are about 12 degrees. In order to cover a 14 by 17 field at 40 inches, a minimum of a 12 degree angle is necessary. Of course, we utilize 14 by 17 fields. Uh, we'll be doing chest radiography, KUBs, things like that. Uh, so we need that 12 degrees to cover then uh, that field with radiation. The anode heal effect, remember what that's all about is that one side of your tube is gonna have more intensity uh, than the other. So if we read the unfortunate consequence of the line focus principle is the radiation intensity on the cathode side of the tube is greater than that on the anode side. You wanna keep in mind that when these electrons strike the face of the anode, they interact at varying depths within the uh, metal itself. The intensity is reduced beneath the anode because the x-rays have a longer path through the target. So if they're being created and then they have to go through the target material, 
uh, many of them are going to be absorbed by the anode uh, material itself, whereas then less would be on the cathode side. So the smaller the angle, the larger is the heel effect. As I said, more absorption on the anode side, less absorption on the cathode side, giving you the more intense beam on the cathode side. And it can be pretty significant. The difference in radiation intensity across the useful beam can vary by as much as 45%. If you look at the diagram, 100% would be where the central ray would be. And then look at the anode side decreasing very uh, rapidly and then the cathode side increasing. The heel effect is important though when X-raying anatomical parts that differ greatly in thickness. A uh, classic example, of course, is the AP of the thoracic spine. The thorax area is thicker. That would go under the cathode side of the tube. The uh, cervical thoracic area is thinner. That would go under the anode side. So place the thicker part under the more intense beam, the cathode side. Off focus or extra focal radiation. When electrons are streaming across the gap from the cathode and they interact with the anode, some of them bounce off of the focal spot and interact then with other areas of the target, causing the x-rays to be created from outside of the focal spot area. Hence the term off focus or extra focal. So these photons are collectively referred to as off focus or extra focal radiation. Uh, you see this uh, when you're collimating down and you're still seeing a tissue shadow. Uh, Off-focus radiation can image patient uh, tissue that was intended to be excluded by the collimator. The use of a grid will not reduce off-focus radiation because it is happening up at the tube area. So the way to reduce it uh, is to, on your variable aperture light localizing rectangular collimator, that's a mouthful, uh, on your collimator, remember, you've got upper shutters and lower shutters. Those upper shutters are going to reduce or help to reduce the off-focus radiation. And then remember, the lower shutters help to reduce penumbra. Tubes do fail. Uh, X-ray tube life is extended by using minimum radiographic factors of MA, KVP, and exposure time that are appropriate for each anatomical part. Remember, uh, if you can use lower techniques, it's less heat. So several causes of tube failure are related to heat. Heat is dissipated in three ways. You can get rid of heat by what's called radiation, which is a transfer via emission of infrared radiation. Conduction, transfer from one area of an object to another. Or convection, which is the movement of a heated substance from one place to another. Uh, for example, in the extra tube, heat is conducted to the oil surrounding the tube itself. Excessive heat does result in reduced X-ray tube life. And maximum radiographic techniques should never be applied to a cold anode. The anode should be warmed up first using a low technique. Extra tubes also failure due to what is called arcing. High temperatures of the filament allow some of the tungsten atoms to vaporize and then plate out on the inside of the glass envelope. This along with uh, tungsten vaporized from the anode then can disturb the electric balance of the x-ray tube uh, abrupt intermittent changes in the tube current, which means instead of going straight across, it's going to angle down. Uh, filament to anode uh, can occur, leading to then arcing or tube failure. So remember, arcing is caused by that deposition of tungsten on the inside of the glass. It's a metal, and some of those electrons can then be attracted to uh, that metal. Also remember that the extra tungsten also increases the inherent filtration in your x-ray tube as well. And then finally we've got rating charts. We don't generally use these today. We have to know how to use them though for the registry. Uh, why don't we use them? 
If we read radiographers today do not generally utilize these charts directly as they are incorporated digital, digitally into the x-ray tubes circuitry. Basically what these charts do is they protect the tube. They protect the tube uh, from damage if uh, either it's too hot or you're using too high of a technique. And there are three charts that are utilize. There is the radiographic rating chart, which is to the right, an anode cooling chart, which is there, and then a housing cooling chart, which is very similar looking to the anode cooling chart. As far as tube rating charts, we've talked about these before. I want you to look at the chart. I want you to notice the little box uh, rectangle in the uh, bottom of each of the charts. You can see that it gives you an amount of RPM and it also tells you what phase, what focal spot size. You've got to be very careful that you choose the correct chart uh, based on that information. So on the register, if you're given a tube rating chart question, make sure uh, that you're looking, uh, that you are using the correct uh, chart. When we look at this, the KVP is on the y-axis, your time is the x-axis, and then you've got varying curves which, with the different MA values uh, indicated. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to plot out your technique. You're going to go to the y-axis, look where your KVP is at, go over uh, on the graph to where the time would be, and then plot that point. And then you're going to look to make sure that the point uh, is below the MA curve that you're looking at. If it's below, it's safe. Any point plotted above uh, the line would be unsafe. And then finally, we've got anode cooling charts. Uh, if you look at this one, you can see it tells you basically how many uh, heat units can be applied uh, to that anode uh, and then how much time would it take for that anode to cool. So you've got the y-axis telling you the heat units and then the x-axis is your time in minutes to cool. Uh, if we read the anode has a limited capacity for storing heat of course, heat is measured using heat units. Remember the formula for heat units is you take your KVP, multiply it by your MA, multiply it by your time, and then you're going to multiply by a rectification factor. Uh, there is a little bit of variance depending on the author that you look at. But remember, uh, if you're using three-phase six-pulse equipment, you're going to take that KVP, MA, and time and multiply it by 1.35. Uh, if you're using three-phase 12 pulse, uh, use 1.41. Once again, there's a little variance between authors, but uh, these are the numbers that we've been using in class. Uh, and this chart then is used to determine the thermal capacity of the anode and its heat dissipation characteristics. So in closing, I just want to uh, thank Bouchang, whose information uh, this lecture came from.